Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Chu. I'm a urologist from Vancouver, Canada. I'm Dr. Naim Bojani, a urologist from Montreal. We're here today to talk about uh, our experience with the next generation flexible ureteroscope from Boston Scientific with intravenal pressure measuring capacity. So the next generation Lithoview is called Lithoview Elite, and not only does it sense intravenal pressure, which of course is the, the, the obvious thing, it also has much better image quality than the original Lithoview. Uh, so overall, a, an improvement uh, in this uh, new next generation scope. So Naeem, we did a meta-analysis and we looked at about 251 articles. 13 of them met our eligibility criteria because we were looking specifically at the very serious complication of urosepsis after ureteroscopy. We had just about 5,600 patients, ages between 43 to 77. And we looked at what the incidence and the risk factors for urosepsis was after ureteroscopy. One of the most interesting findings uh, of our study was that we found a pooled incidence rate of urosepsis after ureteroscopy of 5%. The six things that we found that were really significant were preoperative stent placement, having a positive uh, preoperative urine culture, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, being an older age or having actually a longer procedure time. Were you surprised by the five uh, percent? I, I was a little bit at first. Were you? I mean, it seemed like a high number, you know, one in twenty. Yeah. But after thinking about it, I actually thought maybe that is about right. Some of the patients we don't see back because they present to other hospitals. But I, I think it's actually a real number. We actually did another study looking at the IBM Market Scan database, which has about one hundred and five thousand ureteroscopies in it, and it actually confirmed that the rate was five point five percent of urosepsis in a very large real world ICD nine ICD ten code. So that meta analysis did it actually was confirmed by by real data. Now we have two very strong studies that confirm the same finding. Um, so I think five percent is a real rate. It's important because. We now have to take this more seriously. So one of the factors we don't know about with urosepsis, besides the six things we've looked at, we haven't been able to measure is intravenal pressure. And there have been some things historically done in intravenal pressure. But now that we have an ability to measure intravenal pressure in every case, I think this will allow us to do more studies. So what is intravenal pressure just with nothing going on? So I think that's important to understand that uh, intravenal pressure changes significantly uh, depending on what you're doing. So uh, at baseline, the intravenal pressure is any, going to be anywhere between 0 and 6 centimeters of water. If you have an obstructed kidney, that pressure can go up to almost 10 to 20 centimeters of water. Uh, and then if you have a, a, a case of ureteroscopy, the pressures can go up above 40 millimeters of mercury. Now we're talking about possible pilovenous backflow. If you get up above 80 millimeters of mercury, you could cause fornicil rupture. And there is some data to support, although it is older data done on uh, an animal model, that if you get up close to 200 millimeters of mercury, you can cause some permanent damage to the kidney. So these are some of the complications you get from elevated intravenal pressure, pilovenous and pilotubular backflow, fornicial rupture, uh, pain, and potentially infectious complications. Right. And really, all of the studies that have been done now have sort of been a bit anecdotal, smaller studies. Very interesting data coming out, uh, but I think we need to start to understand what the cutoffs are, right? We don't yet know. At what point do we start becoming worried about a possible post-operative infection and, uh, or post-operative pain, as you mentioned? We don't really know those cutoffs yet. The other thing we don't know about intravenal pressure is what is the safe level and is it a sustained level over a certain amount of time, over a certain uh, level, or is it just one peak level? And once you get above that, it just kind of opens up the floodgates. So I think these are things we just don't know because we've not really been able to study it. Absolutely. And, and I think also, you know, patient factors are important, right? So a patient who's younger, doesn't have any comorbidities, never had an infection. Uh, these are patients that you're less worried about. But on the contrary, if you have a patient who's older, has many comorbidities, has had a septic event in the past, maybe we should have even lower intravenous pressures for those patients. What are the only two things that we know right now that can control intravenal pressure? Definitely irrigation, right? The types of irrigation that you're going to use uh, have a significant impact on intravenal pressure. Uh, and then possibly uh, the use of a urolaxer sheath can uh, impact intravenal pressures.
Also really interestingly was when we looked at the different types of irrigation, right? So gravity uh, versus uh, pressure irrigation versus hand irrigation. You know, we learned a lot and, and noticed that when you use hand irrigation, you could get those pressures pretty high. So you don't want to push too hard uh, when you're using hand irrigation. On the other hand, too, watching some of your cases, using hand irrigation, you can actually control the pressure even better, meaning you can even go lower than just setting up, for instance, a pressure bag where it's very high that just infuses all the time. How would people measure intramural pressure during your rhetoroscopy prior to having this scope? Yeah, it's really interesting. If you look at the literature, uh, you either have to put a nephrostomy tube in or you have to add uh, special equipment to be able to measure intramural pressure. So this scope... Uh, it's going to make it a lot easier to measure pressures uh, while doing rheteroscopy. And we can measure it in every case in, in real time as well, too, just by, by looking at it. And there's nothing that you have to do that's special, so it makes it a lot easier. The new LithoView Elite ureteroscope actually uh, hooks up to its own console now, so it actually can integrate into your OR stack. You don't need the separate monitor anymore like you did with the original LithoView. So here we are in the case now, and... You have to first of all zero it so that it'll zero to atmospheric pressure. And then you need to actually set what the intramural pressure limit is. What, what do you set yours at? I always set it at 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, we know that pilovenous backflow begins to occur around 30 to 50 millimeters of mercury. And so I like to have that um, little reminder of uh, uh, when pilovenous backflow begins to occur. What we don't really know is what we should set it at and when things do occur. So certainly more studies are needed. So in this case here, we have a ureal axis sheath, a 12-14 ureal axis sheath, and we're using a pressure bag of 150 millimeters of mercury. And what you'll see is in the renal pelvis, the pressures are around 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. When you go into these smaller calices, the pressure rises to about 80 millimeters of mercury. And then when you go back into the renal pelvis, that pressure goes back down to about 20 millimeters of mercury. Have you found similar things uh, when you've done your cases? Yeah, so these smaller areas certainly do have higher pressures, don't they? And yeah. it's, um, besides the two things that we talked about where we thought it was just really the irrigation pressure and the use of a ureal access sheath, there's coming some more uh, subtleties that we are beginning to sort of just embark yes. upon to understand, and we don't, we don't understand them yet. Yeah. So with my case here, this is one patient with a ureal access sheath on one side, and uh, she's 68 years old. And we're doing one side with the ureal access sheath. And you'll see here the pressures range between 25 to about a maximum of about 37. And you'll see here that the alarm did go off because it's gone over my set limit of 30. But really, it's staying around 26 to 37 with the ureal access sheath. We're using a 1214 access sheath. Fluid is actually coming out of it. And then we do a bilateral uh, ureteroscopy on this patient. And on the other side, there was much less stone burden. So I decided not to use a ureal access sheath. And what you'll see is that the pressures here actually go up to over 107. Same patient, uh, so same tissues, and no, none of them were, neither of them were obstructing. But you can see here, just from the ureteral access sheath, that the pressure difference was really quite, quite remarkable. I, I find this really fascinating. This is one of the things that really interests me with this new scope. Um, two patients are doing very similar things. Uh, but the pressures are completely different. It's almost impossible to predict what those pressures are going to be. Yeah, and it's not basically just use of a ureal access sheath or an irrigation system either. I think we, we found that, you know, anatomy probably plays a significant role, right? Uh, that UPJ, if it's tight, there's less backflow of fluid, uh, and the pressures are really quite high. Why don't we just use gravity all the time? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think uh, in some cases we need to seal a bit better, so we want to use pressure irrigation, but definitely if you can use gravity, that's probably a really good option. This is a case where the 35 centimeter access sheath was actually in the distal ureter. This patient was a young 32 year old gentleman. His BMI was low. He was incredibly muscular and fit. We're using a pressure bag of 150 millimeters of mercury. And the reason why our access sheath is actually in the distal ureter was because we couldn't get it up any higher. The ureter was just simply too tight to accommodate the entire ureteral access sheath. And with us um, doing, before we did anything, his pressure was actually up to 200 millimeters of mercury. And we hadn't started lasering, hadn't done anything, had no obstructing stones. So the first thing we did was we actually aspirated with a syringe. And we wanted to decrease that intramural pressure. 
And before this, I really would not have known what the pressure was. I mean, there really are no visual cues. Do, do you find? Like, I, I wouldn't have known what these pressures were before we had something that told us what the intrarenal pressure was. Really, really important uh, point, I think, uh, Ben. Um, without measuring intrarenal pressures, it's very difficult to predict what they'll be. So after we aspirated with a syringe, you'll see that the pressures here went down into the teens, actually, down to about 14. And you can see the whole system collapsing here. So really, the kidney's like a balloon. And when you fill up, that's when the pressure can go up. So we emptied it. And then we started to restart our irrigation. And you can see again that the pressure slowly started to rise again. But certainly, I would not have done this aspiration without knowing what the intrarenal pressure was. And with this patient, his pressure is maintained up to about 170 to 180 throughout the entire case. Luckily, the stones weren't very large, so we were able to treat them uh, relatively quickly. Um, and we did use a pressure bag of 150 millimeters of mercury. In retrospect, I think in order to try to keep them down under 200 or even under 100, I wonder if it would have been better to use your technique of actually using a manual syringe where you can really control your pressures by looking at the visual cues of what the pressure reading is. Sometimes it can be difficult, especially with a younger patient, a tight ureter. Uh, when you don't have much backflow, uh, I, I find that the pressures can get pretty high. And in those are the patients that I really like to use a hand irrigation so I can control it as much as possible. Here's the case of an older woman uh, with multiple comorbidities. Uh, and she actually has a long history of stone disease. And about four years ago when I treated her, she went into urosepsis after ureteroscopy. So it was a patient that I was very worried about. And so she presented in the emergency room with another obstructing stone, as you can see from the CT scan, about 13 millimeters, uh, with uh, fever. Uh, and so she had a stent placed and was sent to me for definitive management. Uh, and so I wanted to be as careful as possible with her. And so first of all, obviously, I treated her uh, infection, which was a Klebsiella. Uh, she got Cipro for one week before the procedure. I also used a larger ureteral axis sheath to try to reduce those intraurinal pressures as much as possible. So I put in a 1214 ureteral axis sheath. And as mentioned, I used hand irrigation to try to control uh, the pressure as much as possible. So here's the actual case. So here again, we have a 1214 ureteral axis sheath. I'm using uh, hand irrigation. And what you'll notice is that I'm only using enough fluid so that I can see. Now, it is a bit cloudy, so that is a little bit concerning with all of her history. Uh, however, again, you can see the pressures are quite low here. Uh, we can't see perfectly, but uh, we can see enough to localize the stone, which is now in the lower pole. We were not able to move the stone out of the lower pole, and so we decided to treat the stone uh, in the lower pole. So with our laser fiber, it was a 200 micron laser fiber uh, and a setting of 1 joule and 10 hertz, uh, we begin to break the stone up. Now, we're working in a smaller calyx, uh, and we're using laser energy. So what you'll notice is the pressure starts to go up slowly. I'm also, I also need to be able to see, so I'm using a little bit more irrigation. And now, in my mind, pilovenous backflow begins occurring around 40, 50 millimeters of mercury. I'm getting more worried about her. I decide to stop, and what I decide to do is take a 60 cc syringe, and I place it on one of my valves and I'm able to aspirate out the fluid as you did in the previous case. Uh, and what you'll notice is that I can get these pressures down quite low. Uh, I'm actually able to get them down to single digits. Uh, and um, so I feel a lot better. And um, what you'll notice is when I restart the case, first of all, my visualization will be much better. And more importantly, the pressures remain low while I treat this stone. So uh, definitely uh, an advantage. Uh, so during the rest of this case, I aspirated three times. Uh, each time takes about 15 to 20 seconds, uh, but the pressures never went above 30 millimeters of mercury. So well below uh, what I was worried about. Uh, and so I think this is a good uh, technique that can be used uh, if ever you're worried about uh, intrarenal pressures getting too high. 90, 95% of my patients will go home same day of the procedure. However, this lady, with all of her risk factors, uh, I kept her uh, in the hospital uh, just for uh, observation to make sure um, that she did well. So after routine post-op follow-up, the patient was discharged home. Has the lift of you elite changed the way you do your ureteroscopy right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, recently I had a few cases where I didn't have access to Lithoview Elite. 
Uh, and it became very interesting because I was always worried about the pressures, but I couldn't tell what they were. Uh, so it has definitely affected the way I treat my patients. Um, I try to keep the pressures lower now, and now I can actually manipulate it uh, if I need to. Yeah, now we know what the actual pressure is in real time before we didn't know. And I've never found myself aspirating more kidneys to get the, the pressure down. And these are things we just would not be able to tell before we were able to actually see what the pressure was. Really what we know is that there's actually numerous factors that actually influence intrarenal pressure. And it's not just simply our irrigation method and ureteral access sheet. We've learned things about anatomy, tight ureters, tight UPJs, and just in the short experience that we've had, uh, it depends really on patient anatomy, whether they're young and really fit with muscles versus uh, older people who maybe the tissue is a bit more elastic who aren't quite as uh, uh, exercise fit. And these things really have made a difference. And I think we, the more we learn now, the more we realize we, what we don't know. Lots of interesting uh, studies coming up yeah. in the future, I think. Mm -hmm.